before at, at our workshops and uh, he, he, uh, we, we, he, you know, he focuses in on identifying the amphibians of Connecticut, but also he has an applied uh, science aspect to his talk, uh, looking at how you might mitigate uh, challenges for these animals in the real environment. Uh, so it, it's, um, it's good to connect, you know, somebody, a practitioner that is in the private sector as well, you know, as well as folks that are work for the public sector. So um, uh, Dennis has a, a master's in environmental science from CCSU, and um, he focuses in on research, conservation, and preservation of uh, you know, reptiles and amphibians. So with that, uh, Dennis, uh, thank you, and um, uh, look, look forward to your, to your talk. Great. Well, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and be able to talk with everyone today a little bit about the amphibians of Connecticut. Um, this is my first Zoom presentation, so hopefully everything goes smooth. I do have some um, coon hounds that are going to be joining us today. Hopefully they will um, be polite and not bark too much, but certainly get ready for some interruptions with some very loud howling in the background. Um, but yes, as Peter was saying, my name is Dennis Quinn. I'm a herpetologist. I've been working in the state of Connecticut now for about 20 years. Um, I own Quinn Ecological, which is a environmental consulting company that specializes in the study, conservation, and preservation of the amphibians and reptiles here in the state of Connecticut. I have had the honor to work with some of Connecticut's most endangered species, um, including the federally threatened bog turtle, uh, which is one of the most endangered turtle species in the world, and um, also working with, um, you know, species of concern like the spadefoot toad, blue spotted salamander, and also serving as the consulting herpetologist. Dennis, you muted yourself. I apologize. Okay, <laughs> well, we need to move a little bit, buddy. Um, and also, I, I don't know where I muted myself, but I also have served as the um, con, uh, consulting herpetologist for the state of Connecticut for about the past six years now. Uh, so that's been an honor. Um, so today I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about the amphibians of Connecticut, um, dive into the diversity because we have a lot of amphibians here in the state of Connecticut, um, a little bit about the identification and the conservation of um, our amphibians. Okay, so diversity and identification of Connecticut's amphibians, um, some of the conservation challenges that are faced by the amphibians in Connecticut. Um, as you guys all are probably aware, Connecticut's a, um, a a landscape that is developing rapidly, which brings about a whole suite of issues when it comes to the conservation of Connecticut's amphibians and reptiles. So we're gonna talk about some of those challenges that we face as a result of Connecticut's developing landscape and some of the methods that we use to alleviate some of these um, conservation challenges. Um, I'm gonna do that by integrating some science-based conservation measures um, for Connecticut's amphibians. These uh, measures are based on scientific studies that have been conducted here in Connecticut and elsewhere within New England. And we're basically um, now apply those results for various projects to reduce the impacts to our amphibians and reptiles in Connecticut. I keep saying reptiles, it's kind of inbred in my mind, um, even though this talk is just about amphibians, um, many of these principles and many of these conservation challenges will apply to reptiles as well. So let's talk first about our salamanders and our newts. Connecticut is home to 12 species of salamander. They're all listed here. Um, we have the slimy salamander, which is a uh, terrestrial species. The redback salamander number two, which is an, another terrestrial species. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about this. This is just an overview of the 12 species that we do have here. Um, some of the more familiar ones might be Number 11, which is the spotted salamander. That's one of our vernal pool breeding species. Another noteworthy species to mention is number eight. That's the mud puppy, which is a fully aquatic salamander species that we have in Connecticut. The only mud puppy species that occurs here in the state. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail. But before we do that, I just wanted to point out that of our 12 species of salamander, five are state listed, two are um, listed as threatened in Connecticut. 
Two are listed as special concern here in the state and one is listed as endangered. The one that is endangered is the diploid blue spotted salamander. That's a species that is highly restricted um, in range here in the state of Connecticut, only occurs in a very few um, populations in the extreme southeastern part of the state of Connecticut. So when talking about the diversity of salamanders here in Connecticut, we break them down into groups. The first group that we have that I'm going to talk about are the mole salamanders. The mole salamanders get their name because of their fossorial tendencies. They spend the majority of their time underground and come out during the nighttime to forage on the, on, on the forest floor. Um, these are the species that are associated with, with fernal pools. Um, where they breed typically in the springtime with the exception of the marbled salamander, which breeds during the fall season. Um, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about vernal pools and the importance of vernal pools um, for these species and their survival and some of the um, management um, techniques that we use to help protect and preserve vernal pools and the vernal pool species that we have here in Connecticut. So vernal pools are really what we refer to as temporary wetlands. Um, they're seasonal wetlands that have the greatest amount of water during the spring and the fall seasons. They get this water primarily through snowmelt, rainfall, and sometimes groundwater sources. Um, they do not have any permanent connections to like by streams or, or inflow or outflow channels. They, their hydrology is sustained on its own through rainfall, snowmelt, or groundwater sources. Now that is very important because one of the critical aspects of vernal, of vernal pools is that they dry up during the summer months. And what this does is it prevents permanent predatory species such as fish from being able to inhabit them. So by having fish not be able to inhabit the vernal pools, that makes a great breeding ground for some of our amphibians, especially our wood frogs, spotted salamanders, marbled salamanders, uh, Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders. So those are the suite of vernal pool species that live here in the state of Connecticut. We're gonna talk a little bit later about some of the conservation measures for this unique ecosystem that occurs in Connecticut forests. The next group of salamanders that we have are the lungless salamanders. This is a very interesting group and it's made up of um, I think it's six, six lungless salamanders that we have in Connecticut. The two that are shown below are the redback salamander and the northern slimy salamander. I separated these out from the other lungless salamanders because the redback salamander and the northern slimy salamander are the only two fully terrestrial salamanders that we have here in the state of Connecticut. When I say fully terrestrial, I mean that like many amphibians, they do not rely on wetland habitats for reproduction or for larval development. The redback salamander and slimy salamander rely on very moist, cool woodlands for survival. And they typically will lay their eggs under rocks or in leaf litter or burrowed into fallen log cavities. And that's where the, the eggs will be able to stay moist and cool. The females will guard the eggs and the eggs will hatch. Now, what's interesting about these, these two salamanders is that they do not have a gilled larval stage like you tend to see in the other salamander species here in Connecticut, like the spotted salamanders, like we just saw on the previous slide, that will develop inside the vernal pool. These guys develop directly inside the egg and then hatch out like little miniatures of the adults. So there's no gilled larvae for the redback or northern slimy salamanders. These are also both great indicators of forest habitat and the, and the um, quality of a forest. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. The next group of lungless salamanders are the Northern Dusky Salamander, Two-Line Salamander, and the Northern Spring Salamander. These three are our stream, springs, and seep salamanders. So that's the types of habitats you'll find these guys in. Um, the spring salamander is the most sensitive of these two, or these three, um, but all of them are very good indicators of water quality within woodland streams where they occur.
Can I go back a slide? I just wanted to point out, it might have been confusing that there was three pictures on this slide and I was only talking about two species. The red back salamander comes in two phases in Connecticut. The striped phase, which is this one here on the left, and the unstriped or lead back phase, which is this one on the right. Another one of our lungless salamanders is the four-toed salamander. This is the smallest salamander and smallest vertebrate species that we have here in the state of Connecticut. It's very cute. Um, these guys tend to be restricted. They have a wide distribution throughout the state, but they tend to be restricted to um, sphagnum um, wetlands is, is typically where they're found. It's also the only salamander species, if you look at the belly, that has a white belly with black little spots. No other salamanders have black spots on their belly. Okay, next group, the newts. <laughs> Connecticut is home to only one newt. That's the red spotted newt or the Eastern newt. Um, these guys are very, very interesting in that they have two very distinct stages. The Eastern newt adult, and then the juvenile terrestrial F stage. So the uh, Eastern adult or the adult stage of the Eastern newt is fully aquatic, spends all of its time in aquatic environments, whereas the terrestrial F stage is fully terrestrial. Um, they spend, you know, the first two, three or four years of their lives within terrestrial ecosystems surrounding wetland habitats. It's a very complex life cycle, one of the most complex life cycles of all the amphibians that we have here in the state of Connecticut. Very easy to identify these guys with the olive brown and the very bright dots or spots running down the back. The last of our salamanders that we have here in Connecticut is the common mud puppy. I don't like to say common mud puppy because they're actually not very common. That is the common name for them. Um, but we should just be referring to them as the mud puppy. Mud puppies are really, really interesting and in that they're very restricted in their distribution in the state of Connecticut to just the Housatonic and Connecticut River drainages. They're fully aquatic and you can see these bushy red gills coming out from the sides of their heads. They retain their gills throughout their adult life, um, unlike many of the other salamander species, which once the larvae develop, the gills will reabsorb and the adults do not have any external gills. Um, this is the largest salamander species here in Connecticut. It can reach lengths of about, you know, 16 to 17 inches, which is a pretty big salamander. So that concludes our salamanders. Moving into our frogs and our toads, um, Connecticut's home to 11 species of frog and toad, um, including, if you look here, number 11, which is the Atlantic Coast leopard frog. This is the newly discovered leopard frog here in, the, in, in Connecticut. This was recently discovered, I think it was oh, four or five years ago now. Um, and it's a really interesting species that has, it's a very cryptic species um, and was only recently distinguished from the Northern leopard frog, which it lives pretty closely associated with. Of our 11 species <coughs> for our state listed, um, the leopard frog, Northern leopard frog is listed as special concern. Um, the Atlantic Coast leopard frog technically isn't listed yet, but it's a candidate species for an endangered listing status. And then the Fowler's toad isn't exactly listed yet either, but it's a candidate for special concern listing. So those two individuals will like be, likely be listed officially sometime at the beginning of 2021. Um, and then the Eastern Spadefoot toad, certainly one of my favorite amphibians in Connecticut, is listed as endangered. So if we look at our toads, sometimes these guys can be a little tricky to identify, um, but 
our toads typically are found in more dry upland habitats than the frogs that we have here in Connecticut. Um, they tend to, um, they certainly breed in early or in, in wetlands, typically early successional open canopy wetlands. And then, then they use a variety of different habitat types. The American toad is much more wide ranging and much more common than the Fowler's toad and is certainly less of a habitat specialist than the Fowler's toad is. The Fowler's toad tends to be restricted to more sandy um, habitats in Connecticut with open canopies and a lot of low growing shrubs to provide cover during nighttime foraging. Uh, the American toad can be found in those types of habitats as well, but it also spends quite a bit of time in forested upland habitats um, and other terrestrial habitats throughout the state. Um, when trying to identify these, the best thing to do is look at both the dorsum, which is the top of the frog or the toad, and the bottom or the venter, the belly of the frog or the toad. That's where you're going to get your two distinguishing characteristics that I like to use in the field when trying to identify or distinguish between these two species. If you look at the Fowler's toad, you'll notice these pigmented spots here in black. And inside that pigmented spot, there's two to three warts in each of those or more. If you look at the pigmented spot, which isn't clearly visible on this picture, there's typically on the American toad only one wart. That's the most, one of the most easy characters to look at to be able to distinguish between the American toad and the Fowler's toad. <coughs> if you're having trouble distinguishing between just the warts, you can look at the belly of the frog. The American toad has modeling. See these black marks or black patterns on the belly? That's referred to as modeling, whereas the Fowler's toad does not have any modeling at all. It's just a basically a white venter or belly, it's almost translucent in color when you're holding them in your hands. So that's a very easy way to distinguish between the two species. So these are our two toads, the American and Fowler's toad. Our chorus frogs, the spring peeper is the only chorus frog that we have here in Connecticut. Um, this is the species of frog that you hear calling very, very early in the season, typically early March, they'll start to begin the call with a very high pitched peep, peep, peep noise. Um, they're also Connecticut's smallest frog species. They can vary in color from this golden yellow, almost to a red. And part of that depends on a couple of things. One is the diet of the frog itself and also the temperature. Um, they tend to be lighter and uh, with warmer temperatures and darker during colder temperatures. And you can see this really big um, vocal sac because this frog is in the process of calling right now. These guys tend to use open canopy wetlands um, throughout the state of Connecticut. They have a wide distribution and are one of the more common frog species that we have here in the state. <laughs> Next is the gray tree frog. The gray tree frog is the only true tree frog that we have here in Connecticut. Um, these guys you don't tend to see very often because well, they spend most of their times high up in the trees. They typically only come down from the tree trop, tree tops to breed during the um, usually late spring, early summer months, um, depending on temperatures. Can you please stop? Sorry, those are the dogs again. <laughs> um, so they come down from the tree tops to breed um, in the late spring, early summer months. Um, one of the cool things about the um, gray tree frog is if you look at the color and pattern of the adult, it's drastically different than that from the metamorph. So the metamorph is um, one that has just recently transformed from a tadpole into a little toadlet or froglet. <coughs> and on the adult, the color is very tan, almost white, with this nice little patterning that allows it to blend right into some of the lichens that are found on the barks of trees. So when it's sitting on a tree, it gives it really good camouflage. And then the green coloration of the juvenile gives them really good camouflage because they tend to spend most of their times around the fringes of wetlands um, in low growing um, vegetation. So they require a little bit more green in their camouflage to be able to hide 
in their coloration to camouflage to be able to hide than the adults do. These guys are pretty common and found throughout Connecticut. <laughs> Next group is the uh, American water frogs. There's a total of six water frogs here in the state of Connecticut. Um, these are two of them. This is the green frog and the American bullfrog. Um, these are probably two of our most common frog species that we have. These are found in most uh, wetlands and, and ponds and lakes throughout Connecticut, especially the bullfrog. It's very common in farm ponds. Um, they can tolerate quite a bit of, um, you know, pollution, I guess you can say, or disturb habitats more so than some of our more sensitive species. These two species are not very sensitive to um, or as sensitive to water quality and things like that as some of the other species that we have here in Connecticut. These guys can be tricky to tell apart though. Um, the bullfrog, if you look at, they have these longitudinal folds or ridges. And if you look at the green frog, you can see the longitudinal ridge goes all the way down the back. Whereas on the bullfrog, the longitudinal ridge does not go down the back. It's lacking that longitudinal ridge and the ridge only goes around the tympanum here right behind the eardrum. <coughs> Bullfrogs tend to be a little bit larger than green frogs as well, but the easiest way to distinguish the two is just looking at that dorsal longitudinal fold. Our next group that I've grouped together for the water frogs, the pickerel frog, northern leopard frog, and the Atlantic coast leopard frog. I put these three together for a couple of reasons. One, they all kind of look similar and they're very tricky to distinguish from one another. And also they share very similar habitats. Uh, most of these are kind of more riparian species in nature. They tend to be alongside rivers and streams and the floodplains that are associated with those rivers and streams. Now pickerel frogs are not quite as tied to rivers and, and streams and the floodplains surrounding them for habitat. They can be in a number of different wetland types in Connecticut and also found throughout many of Connecticut's woodland. But specifically the Northern leopard frog and the Atlantic coast leopard frog, those are certainly dependent on larger river, river systems like the Housatonic River and the Connecticut River. They're not found outside of either of those rivers here in the state of Connecticut. Now the Atlantic coast leopard frog, that's the newly discovered species. <laughs> it only is known to occur currently in the state of Connecticut at two sites, so that's pretty cool. We only have two remaining sites for this species. To be able to distinguish between the two, the easiest way that I find is not so much using color, although there is difference in color. The Northern leopard frog tends to be a much more vibrant green than the Atlantic coast leopard frog, which tends to be more of an olive green or dull coloration. If you look at the femoral reticulum pattern. That's where you can really distinguish these guys in the field. And it's still very tricky to do, but if you look at the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog, you can see the background pattern here where color is dark versus the background color on the Leopard Frog, the Northern Leopard Frog, it's green. So that's the field characteristic that we use to distinguish between these two species. <laughs> If you look at the difference between the leopard frogs and the pickerel frog, the pickerel frog tends to have these spots that are more square rather than circular, which is on the leopard frogs, much more circular in shape. Okay, the last of the water frogs is the wood frog. This is, um, when we talked about a little bit, this is another one of those species that relies on vernal tools for reproduction. Um, and one of the first frogs that you start to hear calling in the early spring. We'll talk more about this species in a little bit when we talk about vernal pools and the conservation of vernal pools. Oh, I forgot there's one more, my favorite. Most forgot my favorite, the Eastern Spadefoot. The Eastern Spadefoot is a really interesting species that we're fortunate to have here in Connecticut. It's the only Spadefoot um, east of the Mississippi, the only Spadefoot species east of the Mississippi River. 
Um, this is a species that lives a fossorial existence. It spends the majority of its time underground where it burrows down and it can burrow down to pretty great depths, typically not too deep during the summer months, um, usually like maybe a foot underground or so if that. Um, but they spend the majority of their time underground and they come out to forage during the nighttime. And typically only on rainy evenings will they come out to forage. Most of the other times they don't even leave their burrows to come out at night. Um, so when we're doing work for spadefoots, we're typically out at night in the rain. And we have a technique that we use to find these guys where we wear, wear headlamps and we do eye shine surveys for them. So we shine in the fields and in the woods and wait for the reflect, reflection from the spadefoot's eyes to point us in the direction of where they are. That technique works pretty well for this species. <laughs> the other interesting thing about the Eastern Spadefoot is their breeding ecology. Um, they're, very, they're very explosive breeders um, and they don't typically have a breeding season. They typically do breed at some point in the spring but they can breed basically at any time of the year. Um, what triggers their breeding is warmer temperatures and high amounts of rainfall. Typically two to three inches of rainfall trigger are required to trigger a spray foot breeding of them. In their breeding pools, they lay their eggs, the tadpoles will develop, and then the metamorphs will hatch out. What's interesting is how quickly this happens. So tadpoles can develop in as little as six weeks, six to eight weeks, um, versus some of the other species in Connecticut, which takes a much, much longer developmental stage. Okay, so that concludes this portion on just the species that we have in Connecticut. I guess if anyone had any questions, I guess I can answer some questions on that now, or should we just continue? I guess we'll just continue. All right, so some of the impacts to Connecticut's amphibians. Um, I break this down into three main categories, human driven declines, disease, and invasive species. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, well, human driven declines are certainly the, the greatest threat that we have to the amphibians of Connecticut, but many of these um, impacts, you know, they go together. Um, invasive species tend to have higher levels of encroachment once there tends to be some level of habitat fragmentation or destruction. Um, you tend to introduce diseases through those mechanisms as well. Um, so these all interplay with one another even though I have broken them into three separate categories. So the first is the human driven declines. And this is habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation. This typically will lead to increased levels of pollution. Um, pollution can stem from uh, increased use of fer fertilizers or it can stem from um, increased runoff from road surfaces and things like that. So salts or other um, toxins that might be on the road and run off during a rain event. So if we talk about habitat fragmentation, I've kind of drawn a little bit of a diagram here. I hope it's good enough for everyone. Um, but habitat <laughs> fragmentation is critical because what it does is it reduces habitat connectivity or the connectivity between different habitats. So in this picture, this is depicting a forest that we have here in Connecticut in two vernal pools, vernal pool A and vernal pool B. I mean, it's very important when we think about landscape ecology and maintaining healthy ecosystems, the connectivity between different habitats, especially vernal pools within a forest ecosystem, it's always, always much better to have multiple vernal pools than it is just to have a single functioning pool. So you wanna main con remain, maintain connectivity between multiple pools across a landscape. So why is this important? If we think about this um, during the breeding season for our, our pool breeding species like wood frog, spotted salamander, Jefferson salamander, at night is when they conduct their annual breeding migrations. And they 
breathe and they live basically in the uplands surrounding these vernal pools for most of the active season or for most of their lives. And they only migrate to reproduce in these vernal pools. So they're only in these vernal pools for typically, you know, one maximum two weeks out of a year. Um, so it's not just important to be able to conserve the vernal pools themselves, but it's critically important to protect the surrounding upland forests and habitat surrounding these pools or else you're not going to effectively conserve the species as a whole. And of course, when we're talking about habitat connectivity, the biggest threat to that is roadways or development or other sort of human activities like development that lend to fragmenting or degrading the habitat. Now, this is a pretty big impact because prior to this road being um, installed across our forested landscape, these two pools were ecologically connected. Now they're no longer ecologically connected because they are separated by this roadway. So what is the consequence of that? Well, there's quite a few consequences or impacts that are re result from habitat destruction. One is direct mortality. Um, you could see salamanders during the spring springtime months, even in the summer months, um, many frogs, especially wood frogs during the migratory season, during the early spring months, migrating to vernal pools to reproduce, having to cross roads. And of course, that's going to lead to high levels of mortality within, within populations. And sometimes, depending on how busy that roadway is, the mortality can be great enough to cause a complete extirpation of a population, especially those that are in close proximity to newly created or, or um, high traffic roads. But this also, you know, leads to habitat fragmentation. When you fragment habitats, you end up um, reducing the gene flow between populations. Reducing gene flow is critical because you want to maintain a healthy <coughs> makeup of genes within your different populations. And one of the reasons you want to do that is that will help to, um, for various species, help to eliminate, you know, the impacts from different things, such as some of the diseases that we have that are threatening our amphibian species. Um, impacts, additional impacts from habitat destruction are um, pollution from runoff and fertilizer. We talked about that, but also roadway runoff. Salts have been seen to impact slime, uh, um, wood frogs in spotted salamanders and developing uh, tadpoles and larval amphibians in vernal pools. Um, and then you have from habitat destruction, what we refer to as your indirect impacts. Indirect impacts are when we introduce by fragmenting our landscape, um, things like invasive plants and invasive animals. Now this may not seem to be that big of a deal, but this is pretty uh, impactful when it comes to the conservation of these species. <laughs> so how do we use science to mitigate for some of these impacts to amphibians? Well, we've done many studies. Many of my colleagues across New England here in Connecticut have done many studies studying the various vernal pool species that we have here in the state and across New England. And part of those, what those studies have told us is how much of the upland habitat surrounding vernal pools these species do use. So if you look here, this is the vernal pool. And this is the distance from the vernal pool on average that spotted salamanders will tend to travel. So spotted salamanders will leave the vernal pool and typically spend most of their time within 400 feet of the vernal pool. That number is quite a bit larger now, but these are older data. 400 feet of the pool in the surrounding forested habitat. And if you look at the Jefferson, that's a little bit further. And then if you look at the wood frog, it's up to 1,550 feet. <laughs> so through research looking at distance travel from vernal pools into surrounding uplands, we are able to better mitigate and implement mitigation strategies for these species. All right, so to protect these vernal pools, one of the things that we do is we implement zones, protection zones around them. So the vernal pool itself is basically your zone one. That's where the amphibians are coming in to lay their eggs, to reproduce. 
um, and where the larval amphibians develop. Um, this vernal pool envelope is really the, is like the zone two. That's the area surrounding the vernal pool, which is critical because many of the species will use this area, but it's also critical, it, it's also critical to the larval salamanders and larval frogs as they're leaving this pool. So once they metamorph from larvae to juveniles, they leave and they spend much of their time in this 100 feet surrounding this pool. Oops. And then we have our third zone. This is the critical terrestrial habitat zone. This typically goes 750 feet from the edge of the vernal pool. And that protects the remainder of the upland habitat that these species are using. Um, when we're talking about pressures from things like development, it's usually okay to develop about 25%, but no more of 25% of that forested upland or uh, forest critical terrestrial habitat surrounding a vernal pool. Once you start to develop more than that, you really start to see significant impacts on the amphibian community and amphibian populations utilizing these pools. Um, so this is one of the methods that we use to help reduce the impacts to development on vernal pools. We use this approach, zonal approach, to basically conserving not just the breeding wetland itself, but the critical terrestrial habitats surrounding it. Next is disease. Um, there's really two diseases right now that are really impacting Connecticut. That's chytrid fungus and the ronavirus. <laughs> now, chytrid fungus is a really, really nasty one. Um, that's the one that's really leading, or we think is creating the worldwide amphibian die-offs. Um, so all the amphibians that we're losing worldwide, especially in the rainforest, are thought to be, you know, not just attributed to chytrid fungus, but chytrid fungus is a ma major player in that worldwide die-off of amphibians. Um, this is basically a, a, a fungal species that typically only um, feeds on plants and um, you know, decomposing um, animal matter in wetland habitats or aquatic habitats. But the species of chytrid fungus that affects the amphibians is the only one that's known to actually feed on living vertebrate species. And that's where it gets a little bit um, tricky because once the fungus gets into the wetland, you can see here, oh, no, that's, that's ronavirus, sorry. It would kind of look similar. Um, basically it has devastating effects on the developing tadpoles and even the adults. Now, one of the things about chytrid fungus is it doesn't just affect, um, well, let's not get into details. If we talk about ronavirus, that's the other one. This is what these pictures are de depicting. These are amphibians or tadpoles, developing tadpoles that have been affected by the ronavirus. These are wood frog tadpoles up here, and these are actually spotted salamander larvae down here. Um, these are causing massive die-offs in many of, not many, but quite a few of Connecticut's amphibians. Um, and our, um, you know, this, this similar die-offs have been, die-offs have been documented in over 25 states and can involve more than 20 different species, including some of the turtles that we have here in the state of Connecticut. So not just amphibians, but it also impacts turtles. Um, you know, it's variable how bad these, um, die-off events will be, or the mortality events will be. It can be anywhere from just a single individual to affecting thousands of individuals within a population. So that can be pretty significant when you're losing thousands of individuals as a result of the virus. Um, it can also affect in the same breeding season, multiple different species within the same breeding pool. So if you have a breeding pool that's supporting three or four different species of amphibian, um, if you do have an introduction of ronavirus into that pool, you can kill off all three of those species in one season. And and there's gonna... a question. Um, Lori asked, are there certain areas in Connecticut where these die-offs are occurring and what do these areas have in common? Um, <laughs> there are, um, there's not a specific area that they are occurring in, 
a lot of the work is still being done and we're still conducting studies on ronavirus, really trying to figure out where it is and where it exists across the state to kind of nail that down. Um, so we don't really have a great understanding of its distribution across the state. As far as we know, it is widespread. It is affecting populations. Um, but, you know, we're still continuing to study it to, to be able to get at answers to some of those questions. So that kind of brings us to the disease prevention. Um, you know, we're going to really need to continue monitoring diseases and we're going to need to continue conducting research on these diseases because um, we don't know too much about either these diseases and how they are fully impacting our amphibians and reptiles in Connecticut. We know there's great impacts occurring, but we do need to do more research to um, really figure those impacts out. Um, and the other important thing is we need to follow our disinfecting protocols that we have. So we can prevent the spread of these diseases just by following some simple steps, you know, and these steps should not just be followed by researchers that are conducting this work, but they should be followed by the general public that's using um, the, the using nature um, during for hikes and, and other recreational activities. So for example, when I'm working with amphibians, if I'm visiting a vernal pool, I tend to only visit one vernal pool every day. So I don't like to go to multiple pools because that risks the spread of these diseases to multiple vernal pools. <clears throat> if I do go to multiple pools, I usually have a set or backup gear. So a separate set of clean boots. And if I don't have that, what you need to do is you need to wash your or disinfect all of your field gear, including your boots, your nets, or anything that may have co come in contact with the water at one vernal pool so we don't risk transmission, transmission of the disease to the new vernal pool. And we do that with a 10% bleach solution. Um, it's pretty um, intense and a pretty labor intensive process. So I tend to have um, multiple sets of field gear when I'm gonna be visiting multiple pools. And then I disinfect, and disinfect all my field, field, field gear at the end of the day. All right, last we have invasive species. Let's see how we're doing on time here. 10 minutes. Um, when we think about invasive species, um, I don't know, maybe I think a lot of people think about animals but, or, and plants, um, but most of the time they don't think too much about worms. One of the biggest and most problematic invasive species that we have here in Connecticut are actually invasive earthworms. Um, there are no native earthworms in Connecticut, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. When we're talking about invasive plants, there's two that pop out um, as really causing large or great impact to the amphibian communities in Connecticut. One, the one up top here is garlic mustard, and the one down here is Japanese barberry. Um, the reason why these cause such a great impact is that both tend to form monocultures. So you can see that they have overtaken the forest floor and gotten rid of most of the plant diversity within the forest um, floor. So this is Japanese barberry monocultures down here, and this is a garlic mustard monoculture up here. <laughs> now that's very detrimental to amphibian, especially salamander populations. We have shown that in areas where garlic mustard and Japanese barberry inf infestations occur, the abundance and diversity of salamanders greatly, greatly declines, especially forested salamanders. So your, your redback salamanders, slimy salamanders, and the vernal pool breeding salamanders like the spotted salamander and Jefferson salamander. There's quite a few reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that it takes away a lot of the habitat, but more importantly, it alters the macroinvertebrate community, the food availability for the salamanders. So you can often find adult salamanders in some of these areas, but you tend to not get recruitment of juveniles because the prey items available for the juveniles um, are typically absent. So although the prey items might be small enough for a larger adult to feed on, they're too large for a smaller juvenile salamander to be able to feed on. So the juvenile salamanders tend to not be able to find food within these landscapes that are inundated with garlic mustard. 
but more not more importantly but just as importantly is what is below our feet <laughs> now this picture shows a forest floor and you can see all this leaf litter that is critically critically important and this is what's really being interrupted and impacted when we talk about invasive plants but also when we talk about um, invasive species like earthworms. So when we talk about leaves, we refer to this as the duff layer um, and how some of these invasive species affect our forest here in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut lacks a very powerful detritivore such as the earthworms. So basically a detritivore is a species that's going to break down the organic leaf matter on the forest floor. Earthworms break down this leaf matter at a very, very fast rate. Natural processes in Connecticut are much slower. So they're typically controlled by fungi and bacteria. So the decomp decomposition rates by fungi and bacteria is much slower than the earthworms. Now, because of that, when you have decomposition only by fungi and bacteria, this is a much slower process, which allows the leaf litter to accumulate. So it accumulates into this layer of duff. Um, and this, this basically, you know, this gets into a whole, um, into the whole realm of creating or the formation of the O horizons. <laughs> but what's really important about this O horizon, which is all of your duff in its various levels of decomposition, is what it provides as far as protection predators and um, food availability for your various amphibian species. So when you earthworms come in and you break that down, you essentially lose all of your duff layer. Let's talk about this a little bit more. So we don't, we aren't really sure this is kind of understudied here in the state. There needs to be more studies initiated looking at this relationship, but we're not sure if the invasion of non-native plants influences greater the invasion of non-native earthworms or the reverse, or if it's more cyclical or they, they play off each other. We're not sure how that works, but we do know that when you have one, you tend to always have the other one. And the more fragmented the landscape is, the more prevalent earthworms are and the more abundant invasive plant species are. And of course, because of that, the less abundant your amphibian species and your other forest floor organisms become less and less diverse and less and less abundant. So why um, are worms causing such a great impact to Connecticut forests? Well, it comes down to the fact that Prior to um, the last ice age, 11,000 to 14,000 years ago, Connecticut didn't have any earthworms. So all of our earthworms were lost during this glacial period. So since the glacial retreat, the forests here in Connecticut have grown free of earthworms. So they don't have the mechanisms to be able to cope. Or they haven't evolved the mechanisms to be able to cope such an aggressive detritivore such as the earthworm. So you can see the effects of earthworms on a forest floor. And this is, this is the one we're, we're really talking about down here. And you can see all these little brown balls surrounding it. <laughs> Those are casts. So that's the earthworm's poop. So basically, if you think about the anatomy of an earthworm, an earthworm is basically just a giant feeding tube. Food goes in through the mouth and out through the butt. And what that food is, is primarily going to be the leaf litter. So you can see by in the introduction of earthworms, it removes the, the leaf litter from the forest floor which removes all the av av available resources, such as hiding spots, um, prey availability, different types of prey that a lot of these amphibians would be relying on. It completely removes them from the landscape, which, 
in turn is going to completely eliminate the amphibians that utilize these forested landscapes for survival. Not only that, by reducing the leaf litter here in the landscape, <laughs> the um, forest floor loses its, its insulative properties. The soil loses its insulative properties from the, from the duff layer. So they get warmer and drier during the summer and they get colder in the winter. So you get into more environmental extremes, which the amphibians are not capable of dealing with. So how do we reduce impacts from invasive species? The number one thing is preventing or reducing impacts to the forest floor or impacts the forest in general. So reduce fragmentation, things like that. We need to stop taking our forest down, stop developing our forest. Um, you can hand remove um, invasive plant species. Um, it's a very difficult and laborious process, but it is possible to do. So that's how we do control for some of the invasive species. And as of now, there's no known method to eliminate the invasive um, earthworms. So that's a really big issue and one that really needs to be getting more attention here in the state of Connecticut because we have in more and more invasive earthworms and a higher abundance of invasive earthworms. And we really need to be looking at how that's going to shift the dynamics of our forest ecosystems over the long term. We can see that there's quite um, drastic impacts to amphibian populations, depending on um, the number of earthworms that have invaded a particular area, but it certainly is understudied and needs more investigation uh, to see just how great those impacts are gonna be down the line, especially with other things such as climate change, which we didn't even talk about. Um, but, you know, what can you do, I think is always the question I get. Um, well, one, continue to educate yourself about Connecticut species and the habitats requirements they, that they have so that you can better inform conservation and management initiatives. That's really important. <laughs> it's also critically important to report listed species to the Connecticut DEEP using the Special Animal Survey form. And Pete will be happy to supply that information to all you guys. Um, I think it's actually on one of my websites, but this is critical because this is the state's database that attract the listing species, listed species locations throughout the state of Connecticut, which helps biologists like me know where they're located, be able to study them and be able to protect them, especially in, when they're faced with development. Um, do not remove species from the wild. Um, we, this typically isn't that big of an issue for amphibians. This is more of a reptile issue where people tend to remove turtles from the wild, but always leave the amphibians or any of the species that you find in the wild. Never keep these species as pets and never release unwanted or difficult to, man difficult to manage pets in the wild. We have a big problem with invasive species, um, reptile species here in the state of Connecticut that aren't so much impacting amphibians, which is why I didn't talk about them but they are impacting um, our native turtle populations. We need to be very um, aware of our role in impacting some of these species indirectly through the relief of non-native species that have the ability to take over and thrive here in the state of Connecticut. Um, lastly, ooh, again, attacked by my dog. Lastly, disinfect yourself, especially if you're gonna be, you know, just hiking through wetlands or you know, having fun in wetlands and exploring through the wetlands, make sure you're disinfecting yourself and your equipment appropriately so you're not uh, spreading disease and spreading invasive plant seeds throughout the ecosystem. And lastly, continue to educate others of the importance of conservation efforts for Connecticut's wildlife. And this is really important. You know, a lot of people um, don't always look at conservation as, um, you know, a good thing. So it's very important to explain to people why it's important and why it is good and why it's important that Connecticut's wildlife does thrive. So that's pretty much it for the talk for today. I do have some more information here. I run a website, pthypatology.com. Um, this is a photographic atlas for the identification of Connecticut's amphibians and reptiles and has a little more information on amphibians and reptiles in Connecticut. Feel free to <laughs> check that out if you have more questions about amphibians and reptiles. Um, I also run a Facebook page, an informative Facebook page at CT Herpetology, where you could talk about or um, 
um, look at some of the things I post, uh, conservation things and threats to the species that we have here in the state. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for their time and the interest in the amphibian advocate. All right, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to write in the chat box or unmute yourselves. Are you able to see the chat box, Dennis? No, I'm not too good at this. All right, no problem. So okay, Diane- okay, I, got I got it, yep. You got it. How do you suggest disinfecting for hiking and such? Is it just looking for seeds and burrs? Yeah, that's one way that, so if you're, if you're hiking, <laughs> it's very difficult, depends on what you're hiking through, but a lot of times there'll be hitchhikers and things like that. If you do get hitchhikers, you could just remove those. Um, um, but I typically, what I'll do is I will um, clean the soles of my shoes um, and wash my hiking gear in between going out to hike. That's really, well, I mean, you, you can only do so much and that really does make a big difference just by doing those things. So the biggest thing is to clean the soles of your shoes. So for any seeds that get stuck in mud or dirt that's in between the treads on your shoes, you can get those out before you spread them to another environment. And that's the only question that I see. Oh, here's another one. Also worked with the state and feds two years ago after possible uh, B-Cell and Jefferson and I can give you more. For okay, great. Really? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, that was a private message. Well, not everyone knows. I don't know how to do this stuff. Uh, Dennis, there's a message I just posted. It was sent to me um, as a direct message, but I wanted to share it with the whole chat board. Can you see it? Yeah. How do you know whether the Eastern coastal leopard frog might have recently been introduced or migrated into the state? That's actually a very good question, a very interesting question. Um, we know because we have done work across the range. There was a team of many hundreds of biologists doing this work. Um, and we did genetics testing throughout the range, all the way, all the way down to the southern states, all the way up into Connecticut. And Connecticut's the northernmost extent of this species range here in, the, in Connecticut. So we did very extensive genetic analyses to show us the distribution and the relatedness between the frogs on the East Coast. Um, the other reason we know that they weren't recently introduced into the state is because one of the things that we do as scientists that we don't like to talk about too much is that we collect what are referred to as voucher specimens. We collect these individuals, we euthanize them, and then we preserve them and put them into the collections at museums as permanent records of where species used to occur across the landscape. Um, and we had in our collections mislabeled within the American Museum of Natural History labeled as Northern leopard frog. But when we went back and looked at all the preserved specimens that are in holdings at the American Museum of Natural History, we found that a few of those individuals were actually Qualfeldi, which allowed us to see that they were at other sites in Connecticut. Unfortunately, through development over the last 40, 50 years, they no longer occur in those areas, um, but we do know that they once did. So it wasn't something that was recently introduced. We had historic data that supports they were here, um, you know, up to 50, 50 years ago and genetic data supporting much longer than that. Good question though. Thank you. You're welcome. And there was um, Dennis, is there any citizen science that they that the students could do in their own school schoolyards? Uh, you know, whether monitoring vernal pools in their school areas. Uh, you know, the, I I remember one time I was walking a trail. Um, you know, in uh, in the middle in uh, uh, Cromwell area, and I saw a frog jump in front of me. And uh, normally, you see a frog jump, you just kind of look at it and. You walk on and this one you know I, I looked at it and I stopped and and I observed it a little more closely and that was one of the voucher specimens you got of the uh the coastal leopard frog and yeah. if I hadn't done that if I hadn't stopped you know observed a little closer 
you know, I would have just assumed it was a frog, a green frog or something, you know, and, yeah. I, and I, it, I encourage the students to never take for granted what you see, you know, really Absolutely. look carefully, you know, would you yeah, agree? I, mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities, especially with the, with the different schools, um, you know, certainly if you're very interested, you can reach out to local organizations within your town. Um, and there's always opportunities to monitor pools and amphibian monitoring programs that are going on. Um, one of the big ones that a lot of towns will do is monitoring for amphibian migrations during the spring months. So the migrations of the spotted salamanders is a big one. Um, and a lot of times they're looking for volunteers to help with that, just to count the number of salamanders crossing roads, sometimes to um, work to help the salamanders cross roads. And there's usually very organized initiatives for that. So there's definitely opportunities to monitor um, amphibian populations within the region. Um, you know, just reach out to, I think, some of the local organizations within the town, they can help you steer, steer you to, in, in the right direction. Is there anything on your website that points to that? I'll, I, I'll check our deep website and I'll, I'll talk with our guys and see if we can link, put a link uh, to our. Yeah, I do. I, I do have things on my website. Um, my, many of the projects um, right now, especially with COVID have kind of stopped. Right. Um, so we're not doing much monitoring with the public right now. We've been restricted from doing that. But right. yeah, I do have things where I do call out for public help. Um, occasionally, one of them was when we were doing the surveys for the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. I was using the public to conduct call surveys and visual encounter surveys for two years. So there's always opportunity with various projects that come up. So, you know, always check back for my website. I do put calls out occasionally. Yeah. for things like Peter, that. one you. thing, Peter, I'd like to add, um, this is Laurie Doss from Marblewood School, is I think two kids, if they're just outside, just documenting what they find. And now with cell phones, it's even easier because... You know, yeah. we've been documenting for years and we didn't know we found a lot of things that turned out to be, um, you know, records, you know, in terms of yeah. elevation for certain species and things like that, which we shared with Michael Clemens at the time. But yeah. I think it's just by just documenting whatever you see, you just never know. And that could be useful at some point in time. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, our cell phones are amazingly good at taking pretty crisp photos and even little videos and uh, yeah, I, that's a great idea. And uh, I, I encourage encouraging that, that, you know, that curiosity, just take, take photos and send them in. And um, you know, here at the Environment, you could send it to our website. You can send it to Dennis. You could, I could forward it, you know, you know to the, our herpetologist uh, here at the DEP as well. So yeah, I encourage that. And you never, like you said, you never know, you know, what, the most common thing, people mistaken pickerel frogs for leopard frogs, but once you find that leopard frog, you'll never make that mistake again. Yeah, you know? very distinctive. Yeah, and uh, it's really cool. So, yeah, share share, um, share those photos, and um, you, never, you, you do not, you, you know, you never know. But, all right, okay. Dennis, thank you so much for your... Uh, I have another your, question here, but it says privately. Oh. I don't know how to answer it privately. Oh, if um, if you go to the chat box, you can send it directly. Send the answer directly to that person. Okay. If you click on chat, and then you could send it to the person that sent you the private message. Instead I'm not of answer it. it's only, it's only about mud puppies. They said they're restricted to who's a tonic in Connecticut rivers. <clears throat> um, would they be impacted by invasive species like the zebra mussel? No, the mud puppy is a very interesting one. We're not even sure if the mud puppy is a native species that in itself can be introduced. Um, one of the reasons why it has recently been listed is to hopefully um, gain a little bit of support for some research to figure out answers to some of these questions. Number one, are they native to Connecticut or have they been introduced? Um, and number two, what are some of the impacts that we need to be looking at or worried about that could be threatening the existence of this species in Connecticut if it's a native one? Um, so we really do not know very much about the mud puppy um, and that's something, you know, certainly with, with additional funding, hopefully we'll be able to look at in the next, in the upcoming years and, and get some answers to some of these questions. So that's a great question. Okay, great. There was a question about reducing uh, invasive species, the impact uh, by, you see that one there by Ben? Or no, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't read that too well. But um, you see that one? It's on the... Uh, chat 
I don't see that one. Okay. Above Chris's, I can resend it. It has to do with um, <laughs> reducing impacts to invasive species in forests, I believe. Yeah. Or reduce reduce impact to forests and reducing impact to invasive species. So that, I guess I might be able to answer that. Um, there, for, um, as, uh, as Dennis mentioned in his talk, uh, you know, you could use mechanical removal um, of invasives. Um, that's one method. Um, uh, cut and paint, which you, you know, that you want to be careful using herbicides, but uh, cutting and painting herbicides on the stems so you don't you minimize the, the uh, impact of spraying it, you know, uh, broad spectrum. Uh, but um, in, invasives can be managed judiciously if you, you know, if you list where they are and you, and you plot a plan for uh, managing invasives uh, uh, from, like garlic mustard's easily pulled up by hand if you get a work party going. Um, Barberry is a little more challenging because it, it's denser and it's got, uh, you know, the uh, thorns. Uh, but but um, we're actually going to be doing a presentation later on on you know in the series on in managing invasives. So uh, you know, stay tuned for that. We we you know we'll do a uh, a little how to managing invasives for biological diversity. But um, you you can definitely. Uh, manage invasives effectively using mechanical and strategic uh, chemical control. Can't just answer it in, in five seconds here, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in another talk. Okay. Awesome. And if there aren't any more questions um, regarding the presentation, if you also have any questions regarding the workshop format or Connecticut Envirothon in general, feel free to write in the chat or unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, we can end here. Thank you again to Dennis for your presentation and for Peter, our station leader, for having all of these monthly workshops being filled with great informative presentations. Yeah, you Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks again. Okay. Bye bye, guys. Okay.